in our outside groups. We'll talk about the overview of the panel's process. Um, we started this values and considerations discussion and we may, um, I, I might ask the table facilitators, um, as you go, if you could try to write up what you heard during those discussions outside, and then what we'll probably do is just check in on the list that you wrote um, and see if we need to add anything. And, um, and then after lunch, sort of mid-afternoon, we're going to start doing a high-level overview of the various routes under consideration so that you can get familiar with it and start to look at you know, a sense of what are these options and where do they go and just the kind of that physical aspects of the routes. And then we'll wrap up. I have a couple logistical pieces to share with you. So first of all, some of you, uh, when you came in, we handed out a survey to everybody. And some of you are wondering, is the survey the same as what you filled out or different? What the survey is, is actually we have a research partner who studies these kinds of opportunities for the public to be involved. And uh, she's helping us get a sense of how well was this run and what kind of an impact did it have on you. So that, that survey is for research purposes. Um, uh, you would, would have been asked to identify yourself through a, uh, a code of your, I think it's a mix of your initials and, and first numbers of your telephone number. We will not use that to track who you are, uh, but just simply so that we can compare um, the evaluation before and after later. So please do fill that out. If you have any questions, ask me, Kyle, Michelle, um, and uh, please hand those into your facilitators. At the back of the room is our uh, restrooms. There are only two in this building, and there are probably 70 people in the room today. We are going to have breaks, but it means that at the breaks, they're going to be pretty busy. So I encourage you to just take care of your needs as you need to, rather than waiting for the break, um, because you might end up having to wait a little bit. Um, sometimes our lunch is going to be a little bit later, so please do snack, have a good snack, good snack at breaks, and get up and take a snack during um, the sessions as you need to. Lastly, this is something that you already know, the emergency exits <laughs> are that way. And there's also one at the back, should there ever be a problem at the front. We do have a first aid kit, um, and, um, and uh, of course, you'll look to us for instructions if there is another emergency, which probably there won't be statistically. Okay, so that's it for me. Um, our first presentation is going to be uh, from uh, Mandy Gibbs, and I think we have to switch decks here, anyone. Um, so come on up, and uh, please welcome Amanda Gibbs, the Director of Public Engagement, I believe. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. And I also just want to say a hearty word of thanks to Susanna for that incredible grace under pressure. I think that is a facilitation all-star moment. And to Jefferson Center staff and city staff who basically lined up a backup venue within 10 minutes. So thank you to, and thank you to all of you for your patience. Um, unfortunately, Paul Moultrie had to leave, and he sends his regrets, um, so I'm going to deliver kind of a, a little bit of the sort of state of play from the city. Um, so this process is being led by the Jefferson Center on behalf of the city and multiple departments, engineering, parks, planning, uh, our facilities and real estate group, um, and it sort of sits within the office of the city manager. So that's why Paul was here to welcome you. Um, so essentially, I'll actually grab your slide there, uh, advancer, Susanna. Thank you. Oh, yes. Table facilitators, if you could pass out, uh, everyone will have a copy of the slides um, that uh, Amanda will be presenting. And so table facilitators, if you haven't already, please pass those around right now. Um, and we'll ask that you stick those, there's a spot for learning materials in your binder as well. So, um, Thank you, Kyle. So we'll keep it very brief. Um, so essentially, um, you know, this is your mandate, this is your charge that we've asked Jefferson Center to lead you through. Um, it is to work to represent local neighborhoods, impacted business, and citywide residents to recommend a preferred arterial alignment that best meets the neighborhood, the needs of the neighborhood, the city, and the region as a whole. A small task, um, but a, a really significant one, and one that we want to be very clear about. Um, you know, as you know, we arrived here, for many of you have been through many different processes the city has led, um, and you come to a point where there are so many multiple challenges, stakeholders, it was very difficult to find a way through this. It was essentially kind of a process stalemate. And so we realized that a new way of, of working on this had to come forward. Um, so we know, we've talked about what a community panel is, it's essentially a jury. And it's based on processes that have been 
In fact, the Jefferson Center is one of the leaders in North America 30 years ago, starting to develop this kind of process where it's a kind of democratic engagement that really asks to try and find a representative group of folks within a, 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 an affected area to work together in depth, to take the time that is required to walk through the trade-offs and the challenges. So it's a sincere attempt to come to enlist the support of community and businesses and to give you a chance not just to have to sort of educate yourselves or come to the odd meeting, but to actually walk through this in a very in-depth fashion. Um, so really, specifically, there's two things that we wanted to emphasize, and as Kyle said, this will be within your packages. The first is to work to develop a set of criteria to guide the evaluation. So you will be developing the criteria to decide what's important in terms of the decision making. So that's you know, an absolutely key piece. That is the filter through which you will make a recommendation. And then secondarily, to recommend a route. Now it may be that you end up in a place where not everyone agrees. As any, both city council and park board, and that will be a formal presentation where your recommendations, your findings will be presented in detail, and you'll have a chance to have a very focused audience with city council as well as with park board. At that point, um, engineering, because this is an arterial road, while this process really represents um, a, you know, a number of different areas and departments and, and, and uh, challenges, Engineering will then take that panel input, start to actually work with it, assess it, do a technical review, and then the engineering staff will go to council with their technical um, uh, report that will include the panel. And at that point, they'll have to talk about where they have aligned with the panel or have dissented from the panel. At that point, the council will make a decision on the route using all that information. And then, subject to that, then the, then the work of funding strategies, design work, and all of that thing will continue. In terms of park board, because if there is a, a, a impact to any park lands, uh, including Trillium or Strathcona Park, at that point, the park board also has a process. So when you present to park board, they would also have to make a decision, and then at that point, um, park board would have its own process. They would work with all the affected folks, do their own technical review, their own cost analysis, and then park board would go to a vote on that as well as whether to proceed. So you can see this is a, there's lots of governance and there's lots of decision making here, but this, this piece of public input, a significant piece of input that you will be developing is going to be leading the charge and will basically be the recommendation against which all other things are assessed. So it's an important piece. So on behalf of the city manager, on behalf of the deputy city manager, I just want to thank you. This is one of the most heartening things that um, any of us can be part of, where you've chosen as residents uh, and business owners to make such a huge, um, huge contribution of your time and your energy and your emotional uh, kind of bandwidth for this work. It, it's really an honor for us to have you here. I can't tell you how significant this is for us, and we take it very seriously, and we absolutely stand by that, and we'll make sure that your work is day-lit and honored, and that everybody understands what you've done here. Um, we want you to stay focused, if you can, to really be clear about what it is you're doing, and I think Jefferson Center, as process experts, will be great to lead you through that and help guide you through that process. Um, and then, you know, really this is the beginning of more process, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, but it's the beginning of the conversation. Anyway, I just want to thank you again, and um, I'm going to, I think, turn it back to Jefferson Center. I think we'll have time for a Q&A um, uh, following the next presentation. Okay, thank you, Amanda. Um, uh, everyone, I'm Kyle Bozenko. Nice to meet you. We got to skip our introductions, but that's all right. You're going to have to hear from me a lot anyway. Um, I'm the uh, director of the Jefferson Center and the project principal on this. We're we'll working with Susanna to support you and your work. Um, I'm going to invite Juan Leclerc, the director of transportation, to talk with you uh, next. And uh, as we do that, I'm going to do something, introduce a bit of a way we're going to do this with the rhythm of our presentations there throughout. Uh, the table facilitators, I will hand you out Juan's slides. Um, also, in your notebooks, in a in your orange tab, there are note-taking sheets 
that are designed for each presentation. So you'll get the slides and you also have a note-taking sheet for this presentation. I just wanted to uh, direct you to that now uh, because for each of the experts you'll, we'll be hearing from throughout the course of our time together, you'll have these slides and then you'll also have note-taking sheets that are prepared for you to capture your thoughts. So I'm gonna pass these around and we'll let Juan get going. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, I'm the director of transportation, so uh, lots of people don't like me. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really hard to make the right decisions in transportation, I'll just say that right off the bat. Uh, usually, uh, someone is a little bit concerned with your idea or your proposal and uh, has a different, slightly different idea, so I'm used to that. Um, my presentation, I'm going to quickly run over a few of the, the uh, Key things for transportation, first of all, just talking about arterials in general, uh, the major streets in our city, uh, why we need to do rail grade separation, and then specifically on this particular project, what is the rail grade separation strategy. Uh, all of our work is guided by um, some overarching city policy and documents. So these, uh, for transportation, the biggest one is Transportation 2040, which is our long range transportation plan. But transportation um, direction also comes from our Greatest City Action Plan, our Healthy City, our Healthy City Strategy, and numerous other documents. Um, but at a high level, you could say that the, the, the goals for transportation are pretty straightforward. Uh, one is to um, actually move more people more efficiently on our streets. So recognizing we have growth. And the way we do that is uh, uh, shifting to walk bike transit, which are very efficient modes. Uh, the second big goal is the moving towards zero, and that's basically a safety target. So we don't want any fatalities on our street system. So our investments are either achieving one or the other, but most, most of the time our investments are achieving both. Uh, in terms of this chart here at the bottom here, this is just the total number of trips that are taken in a, say, think in a single day. So um, uh, over time, uh, out to 2040, we expect the number of trips that are being made on, this, on the road system to increase. Uh, that's just because of increasing jobs and population. Um, what this is showing is that that increase uh, is going to be handled all on walk, bike, and transit. Uh, and that's been happening for the last 20 years, actually. We've been accommodating all of our trips on walk, bike, and transit. And if we continue to do that, and if we continue to get a few more cars off the street, we can even uh, reduce congestion. So your task uh, is the, the, the tough one that I usually have to do, <laughs> which is to recommend uh, an actual uh, project. Uh, and really, it's uh, a route for a great separation of the primary arterial that serves the flats um, in a way that meets the needs of the neighborhood, the city, and the region as a well. whole. First of all, um, arterial streets. Uh, we really have two types of streets in the city, arterial streets and local streets. Uh, and this map is showing all the arterial streets. In between all these streets, there's typically about eight blocks of arterial streets, or local streets. Uh, and local streets really should um, be serving local needs. And what, what I mean by that is that we know a local street is failing when arterial traffic is using it. Uh, and that, that, that's what people call shortcutting or rack running. Uh, so there's a problem on the arterial when they start using local streets. The arterial streets are intended for everyone to get from everywhere to everywhere. So arterial streets are for non-local traffic, but they also, of course, accommodate local traffic. So, um, And while you can think of, it's, uh, of arterial streets as traffic, it's just a whole bunch of cars and buses and trucks, but the reality is our, our, local, our arterial streets are also really important places. And in fact, if you look at any great neighborhood in our city, it typically is occurring on an arterial. Uh, whether it's Main Street or South Granville or Fourth Avenue or in this area, Hastings or uh, Commercial Drive. So often the, the busy, busy arterial is also the neighborhood street. So it has, it has to play with both, both roles. What do we mean by great separation? So um, typically <coughs> rail crossings uh, that are at grade, that's what we call it, that's when uh, you have to take your turn, right? So. The train comes, all the traffic has to stop, and then when the train's gone, the cars can go. Uh, so that's, that's a pretty typical uh, crossing uh, that we would have. Uh, over time, um, on all of our important rail routes, uh, we've been introducing grade separation. This is the example of the pedestrian overpass at Victoria Drive. So um, in terms of the need for an arterial, um, the, the reality is, is that uh, if we don't have, well, 
occupied, well spaced arterials, uh, that the local streets will start to take on arterial roles. And so there is a certain uh, frequency or pattern of, uh, of arterials that are required. And uh, for example, this, this gap here, we're talking about prior, primarily, uh, as, as the, uh, uh, the arterial to be replaced. If it didn't exist, basically, uh, we would have a problem with all the local streets in the neighborhood there having to, to carry that traffic. Uh, in terms of freeway, um, our city has no freeways. And uh, a, a freeway is something that, in, in fact, um, it, it's got its pros and it's got its cons. One is that it's very good at moving traffic. What it's not very good at is moving people on foot or bike. <laughs> uh, those are, there's actually a lot of activity that's excluded on a, on a freeway. Um, also, freeways are usually rare and far between, whereas our arterial grid is actually a pretty well-developed grid, and actually that brings a lot of resiliency to our arterial network. What I mean by that is that if there's an incident on one of these streets, uh, usually the rest of the network is, is uh, robust enough that it can actually carry that diverted traffic. Um, and just uh, so to cut, just examples here again. Um, uh, here's Broad Bridge, for example. You know, primarily a vehicle moving street. Um, if you look at the past, even in the 20 years that I've worked at the city, uh, the natural number of vehicles going over that bridge hasn't changed. It's actually about 60,000 a day, slightly less actually than than it was 20 years ago. Uh, but the number of people walking and biking over it has increased dramatically. You know, so where we only had a couple thousand uh, people walking and biking over it, now we have close to 10,000. Uh, a lot more people taking transit. So that's what I mean when I was saying like the, the shift to mode. Uh, so uh, that's going to be the case for the new arterial, uh, that it actually has to do a better job of all of those things, the walk, bike, and transit, than it has to do for the, for the auto. Uh, so in 2015, uh, City Council directed staff to downgrade prior, uh, and this is important though, to a local serving street upon completion of a new east-west arterial. So uh, it is a direction for us to do that, uh, and uh, the replacement arterial wasn't defined. And so that is a question for us, you know, if we're going to downgrade um, prior venables, uh, where does the uh, arterial traffic go? And the, uh, the one thing I'll mention about it too, the bridge grade separation is critical because uh, right now, um, all the options that you're gonna be looking at uh, don't have an opportunity to cross the tracks. Uh, at those locations, an overpass will be required. False Creek Flats Community Plan uh, was completed uh, not too long ago, and as part of it, we were trying to solve the question of the uh, east-west arterial to serve the flats. Um, it was, it, we just found it too challenging, and so we kind of pulled it out of the plan, uh, completed the plan, and basically let this, set this as a separate task uh, for us to do. So in general, there's uh, four root options that you're gonna look at, but in fact, when you get into the details with the team later, you'll see that there's variations on each of these. So um, there's actually many, many more options than what you're seeing there. But uh, you know, you have the, the prior Venables uh, option. And in the, in, the, in the world where we're not able to achieve one of these, uh, William, Malkin, or National, uh, ultimately the traffic does stay on the prior Venables. Uh, there is really uh, no change there. So we do want you to be looking at all of them and all the variations within them. So um, uh, the uh, the Dunsmuir Viaduct, so the Northeast Falls Street Viaduct, so as, as well. Council also directed a replacement of the um, uh, the viaducts, and this is as part of the Northeast Falls Street. Uh, the viaducts. It's interesting that the Seattle viaducts are in the news right now. I don't know if you know that because <laughs> they've closed them because uh, they're taking them down and they're doing it. The replacement road network is largely built, but they're doing the last bit of transition. Uh, the same for us, actually, uh, seismic problems with the viaducts. Uh, the only efficient way to actually get them seismically upgraded is to replace them. Uh, we replace them with a different uh, road network. <coughs> oh, excuse me. So, uh, it, and it's, it's somewhat related to this project, but not, in the sense that it is completely independent. Um, but this here is the new Georgia Viaduct connecting down to a new Pacific Boulevard, which is widened two-way arterial, uh, and that new Pacific Boulevard connects onto prior. Uh, at this point right here, all of the options that you're gonna consider are gonna connect right to here. 
So this, from this point on, uh, nothing, nothing changes. That, that plan is kind of set. Um, yep? Uh, the Georgia viaduct is being replaced by a new viaduct, that's right. So right now it's a, a very long viaduct, it's three lanes, uh, and the new duct going one way. Uh, the new viaduct is four lanes, two ways, so it's both directions, and it's quite a bit shorter because uh, it goes right down to Pacific. Um, and when we look at that too, again, because the arterials uh, we want them to be places. We do want them to be places that people enjoy being. We want them to be loved. Uh, and so uh, we're very mindful about designing these new streets. Uh, we want them to feel great to walk along, you know, great place to open a shop. Uh, so the, the vision for the new Georgia Viaduct, or the new Georgia's Ram, uh, and the new Pacific Boulevard is really a great street. We really want it to be a great street. Uh, and ideally, we would want that great street concept to continue right through the flats. You know, so again, uh, on all of the options, you kind of have to think of that. You know, that uh, that this street should be fantastic. You know, kind of a place that you you love driving down or walking down or taking transit on. Why do we need great separation? Well, Vancouver is a port city. Um, it's what created us, right? If you think about, uh, it's what determined that Vancouver would become one of the big cities in Canada. Uh, was in 1986, this railway came to the waterfront and basically there's an interchange between uh, rail and boat. And so that's still the case today. Uh, goods from all across Canada uh, go out through this port. Uh, of course, goods from other various places around the world uh, come through here. Uh, and uh, these are the main rail lines that connect to our port. And so the portion that we're talking about here is a, a segment of the rail system called the BI line. So the Broad Inlet line is actually owned by BNSF, which is Burlington Northern Santa Fe Railway, uh, but it's operated by CN, and uh, so CN operates on it. And uh, we're expecting uh, this to continue to grow. Uh, you may have heard that there's expansion plans at, uh, at uh, Centrum. Uh, you know, ultimately they're doing expansion which will allow them to double the capacity. Um, although the increases that we get are year by year, you know, a couple percent up and down, that's kind of the way it goes. Uh, but, they're, but they are uh, anticipating some significant growth and so uh, that means a lot more uh, goods being moved by rail. Uh, and what's happened recently too, uh, we used to not have too much activity on this rail line, and it was largely because CN and CP were uh, cooperating and using just the, the CP line, uh, the one along the waterfront. And the one along the waterfront is fully grade separated, so it actually has no interactions with, uh, with vehicles, and so there's a lot of capacity on that. Uh, it's just recently that it's gotten to the point that they've really started to activate this line uh, and use it in a, in a really um, frequent way. Uh, they're also looking to, to double the tracks uh, on that. When you look at the authority for um, rail, it is a bit different um, because rail is governed by the federal government. So it's not something that the city has any direct control over. Uh, the railways uh, have a, a authority um, with the feds. Uh, with the city of Vancouver, we really own all the streets. So our world is the streets, and, uh, and that's kind of an, a, a nice thing uh, because the city can make a lot of decisions on behalf of its residents and businesses without having to actually check in with uh, senior governments too much. Uh, in terms of the major road network, some of the major road network is truck route, and some of it is called major road network, uh, which is something we co-manage on TransLink. And so it kind of acknowledges that our roads actually also play a role uh, for the entire region. And so um, we, should, we should do that, check in with them. So um, uh, in the meantime though, uh, we still do have an obligation to make these crossings safe. And so in the, it's not like we're going to wait until an overpass is built. Uh, we, are going to, we are in the process right now of upgrading a lot of our rail crossings to improve safety at them. Uh, so we don't know when that uh, overpass or underpass will be built. Uh, the rail corridor strategy that was adopted in 2008 sort of laid out the plans for the BI line or the Bardet line. And basically, um, 
we looked at what would, what would it take to kind of fully protect uh, this corridor so that we don't have interactions between trains. Um, the whistle uh, is something that can be annoying, I'll just <laughs> mention that. It's something that doesn't have to happen when the rate, rate separation happens. Like the, the whistle is actually to warn people of impending danger. And, and typically this is because they're walking along the tracks like this, <laughs> or uh, you know, they, the train is about to cross the crossing and it's to give everyone warning that uh, the train is coming through. This is just uh, the number of blockages a day. Um, one thing as well, uh, you'll notice that the activity um, of, the of the railway, uh, it kind of avoids the peaks, which is good for transportation because you know, that's when it's really important that we don't have those kind of disturbances and, and a closure at, in a peak hour uh, causes a lot of problems. Um, but what it means is that uh, in the world where it's great separated, uh, that kind of conflict, we don't have to worry about it so much. That means that more of the trains can move during the middle of the day and less of them can have to move at night. You know, they'll have to avoid the, the peak hours. The strategy, uh, when we looked at it, there was a number of local streets uh, that have to be closed in, in a full grade separation scenario. And then the arterial streets need to be grade separated. So uh, Powell Street overpass uh, was completed in 2014. Uh, it was kind of one of the first pieces of that. Um, this this uh, crossing is the one that you're dealing with and have to think about where how that should be done. Uh, but also we do have the you know walking and biking uh, crossings that we have to resolve as well. Uh, and those can happen at the same time or even <coughs> of, the, of the arterial. So there's a lot of benefits to the rail grid separation of the corridor. Um, improved safety, uh, reduced uh, um, emissions just because of the, the delay, economic benefits in terms of us being more efficient in terms of moving our goods, uh, in terms of shortcutting, the reality is a lot of traffic, when it sees that there's a blockage, they actually make their way around to another overpass, like the Hastings overpass or, or something like that, and so that's something that uh, we don't want to see, and of course, reduced uh, noise in the neighborhood. So, so this is your task, uh, recommend a route uh, for a great separate arterial that best meets the, the needs of the neighborhood city and region as a whole. Um, there's a lot of work that came before this, and, and you'll be learning about all of that. Uh, the one final thing, this is my last slide, is that I do want to mention that uh, when, you made your when you've made your decision uh, about what you think is the best route, and, and hopefully you, you agonize over that, <laughs> um, there, there's going to be impacts. Uh, there's, there's no option there that has zero impacts. There's not one. Uh, but the, the, the one that you select, um, the impacts, we will mitigate them. And that's actually a really, really important uh, part of our work. So when we, when we do work like this, when we did Palo Street Overpass, we didn't just come along and uh, do it. You know, it actually affected businesses, it affected how they accessed them. You know, some of their driveways had to be moved, the doors. Sometimes they had to modify the building a bit. <clears throat> we took that upon ourselves. So you, we want to keep, we want to make sure that all the businesses are whole. You know, in, in all of these impacts, uh, we would like to think that when we've walked away from the project, we've left everyone in a better state than when we approached them. So, you know, whether it's uh, the parks, you know, we have to adjust the park, let's, let's make sure that in the end, we have a better park, right? And so, and that we feel really good about that. So, I just say that just because change is inevitable, guess what? next year will be different than this year. <laughs> but how we manage it is actually the, the really important part. And one, and one other thing too is the time. Uh, when you think about uh, making a decision, that whatever you decide won't be built tomorrow. Uh, and it won't be built next year. And it won't be built next year. Uh, it could be built 10 years from now. It could be built 20 years from now. Uh, because you'll find that uh, in, your, in your information that the senior governments are big players the ports and all of these, they're gonna bring money and we don't actually have a project until um, we have the money. Uh, but the good thing about making a decision about it right now is that in all the years between now and the actual construction, we can prepare for it. And that makes it really easy. So, uh, so whenever we get a new building permit, we kind of make sure that that's going to accommodate the future overpass or underpass. When we start designing the parks, we just, we just kind of get ourselves ready so that 10 years from now, where, whenever it is that it gets built, it, it's relatively easy. You know, all the pain that we saw today is kind of melted away.
That's it. Yeah, so I just asked Lon to stick around. I know Amanda's around as well to answer questions if they come that way. Um, and so I've got my computer here because some of you have been writing your questions down on index cards and passing them to your facilitator. And um, we can do both, uh, hands up and those index cards. But the reason I'm looking into the index cards is I'm looking for what are the questions that are most often being asked, and I'm going to start with those. So um, yeah, I'll do a couple from here, and then we'll have a couple hands up, and then I'll go back to the computer. So if you want to write one down and submit it to your facilitator, go for it. So, this, we'll start, uh, since you've warmed up, we're going to start with a, a nice juicy one. Um, uh, so, Odette and, um, you should have a mic, and if Odette you, and uh, Laura, if you could grab a mic as well. We're going to start over at table two with Holly. Um, you had a question about, where are you, Holly? Okay, I'll let you use my mic in the meantime. Okay, so. It came as direction to staff uh, to downgrade prior as an arterial as a part of a discussion that was actually related to the viaducts discussion. Um, the, the reason that it's on the table is because it is the arterial right now. And it is one of the things that uh, um, in, your in your kind of review of all the options, it felt wrong to remove any option. And in fact, um, when you see there's a lot more options than those. We didn't, we didn't want to kind of um, take any of them off the table if you wanted to kind of talk about them and explore them. Great, thanks. Hey Doug, this next question is for you. Um, and so if, uh, Laura, you could go over to Doug, he's standing, and Odette, if you could head over to, um, oh. Uh, I just, I think I'm gonna summarize this one. Is the reason for that is because I, it's, it was a question that Holly asked, but I know it's a question that some of you ask, and I don't want to have to put you on the spot one more time. Uh, so the question was, what veto powers do any of the part, uh, oh no, this was a number of you asked about it, about veto powers. Number one, table one, Sandy. Right, okay. Uh, just learning that the Parks Board has its own board and for much of authority, it's interesting for me. Uh, the city of Vancouver, and we will make a decision and then it sounds like the Parks Board can ultimately be told that. Uh, I work for you. Can I just introduce yourself, Doug? Sure, so my name is Doug Shearer. I'm a senior planner with the Vancouver Park Board. Um, uh, as everyone doubtless knows, the, the Vancouver Park Board, as uh, Amanda uh, referenced, uh, is an independent, independently elected board, the only one of its kind in a big city in Canada. Um, the uh, status of uh, uh, the parks is that uh, if, there, if, if the panel um, uh, prefers an option that has an effect on the configuration of the parks, uh, that would go to the park board for decision and uh, the, the, the uh, shape or configuration of the parks uh, would not change without um, the support of the, of the elected park board uh, before it went to council for a decision. So there's a lot of players involved. Yeah, okay, and so uh, is that a follow-up question that requires clarification? I just want to make sure we get in touch on other topics, so let's have the question asked, or ask the one, just one follow-up question for a question. Sure. Um, just to clarify, is the Parks Port a subsidiary, for lack of better terms, of Vancouver, of the city of Vancouver? It, it sounds like it's, it, it's independent. I sit on a board nationally, so I'm just trying to understand the parallel. I'm going to, I, I'll, I'll start off by saying that I'm not an expert on the governance of the city and the park board. What I will say is that we take uh, our direction as staff from, uh, from the park board, which is elected separately from the city. They are very closely connected. Our budget is ultimately decided upon by council. Um, the park board uh, uh, approves and recommends the park and recreation aspects of the park board's budget, but that ultimately goes to council citizens for decision. Uh, and I would say that daily and continuously uh, our board and city staff work in very close collaboration. That, that's what I was going to just add is that uh, uh, we work collectively to bring forward projects that we think both our council and our commissioners would support. Uh, 
Uh, so we work really hard on that, and that's going to be a big task. Thanks, Doug. And Lon, can you just talk a little bit about the other partners and what roles they'll play? Sure. Yeah. Um, and then I'm going to ask folks to put up their hand. We'll take two questions that haven't been submitted yet. Yeah, I mean, the, the reality is, is that the city of Vancouver um, is a, <coughs> It's an entity of the province, right? You know, when you think about it that way, we're, we're purely legislation at the provincial level. And anything that uh, <clears throat> the, the province has decided to delegate as an authority to the city, uh, that's, that's kind of all we have. Uh, our partners really, uh, provincial government, federal government, uh, they're really, really important on projects like this. Um, the Powell Street overpass, you'll learn a little bit more about that. You know, the, the real trigger for that was Transport Canada coming forward with a rather big chunk of money. Uh, and then the port, uh, in that case, uh, and the railways, and ICBC, and TransLink. And, uh, and, and why would they all come together to fund a project like this? Because they all have a real interest. ICBC, if they can reduce claims, uh, and they, always, they help us uh, with road improvements all the time. Uh, because the benefit goes to all of the people who pay for claims, <laughs> which is uh, ICBC rates. Uh, the railways, if they can gain efficiencies and run those trains more often or longer and not have to do so much shunting back and forth, there's a real uh, business case for them. And same with the port. So they, they come together to make these projects try to happen. Our, our contribution on the Palo Street overpass was uh, 3.75 million on a $50 million project. So that's, that's how important the partners are. You know? And uh, um, TransLink was a partner uh, in, in, equal, in equal measure as the city. Thank you, and we're gonna to talk tomorrow afternoon actually going through some of that partnership and who's gonna play for what and what are the investments. All right, let's get some questions um, from folks who just wanna raise their hand. Um, and Mark, over there. Would you mind just uh, saying your name? Yeah, I'm Debbie. Oh. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering uh, which this might be technical. Uh, major road networks or transit corridors are the responsibility of the provincial government and how that might um, influence the recommendation before. Yeah, so uh, in the city, um, oh, I, there? Mean, okay. I mean in the flats area. Oh yeah, in, in the city uh, and in the flats there are no provincial, well actually there's only a little bit of provincial road, which is Highway 1, as it enters Vancouver in the very eastern portion of the city and heads towards the second arrows. Otherwise, there are no uh, provincially owned roads in the city. So these are all city city roads. Okay. Thanks. Another question. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if I should address the question to you or there's going to be somebody from another department. But I have a bit of research, but I just wanted to know if you have um, anything about the particulate matter count of vehicular um, emissions along prior Georgia Viva? Uh, so, uh, specific to air quality, uh, that is something that this the region uh, has monitored through Metro Vancouver. So Metro Vancouver does our air quality monitoring. Uh, in, in for, for the roads, generally we've seen really dramatic improvements over the years. Um, the technology on diesel vehicles, even for transit buses, has gotten so good uh, that there's very, very few toxic emissions that come out of them. But the uh, um, they're, they're really high, t high maintenance. You know, um, ultimately switching to electric is where we expect everything's going to go. Uh, at this point, Translink's made a commitment to switch their whole fleet to electric, uh, or only start buying electric buses in 2025. Um, electric cars are coming. It's, it's, it's an issue, I just think it's one that's disappearing with time. Um, related to that question, um, sorry, did you follow that here? Um, I understand if this, what we're doing here, is only going to be, you know, um, you know, acted on like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, and everything's electric, but, you know, in the event that, you know, they, you know, it's done fairly, you know, soon. Um, I think it's really important to have those counts because if anybody has ever traveled along prior, the houses have been trashed. The uh, bushes, trees, whatever, you know, don't thrive there. And um, there's one major business, Asian Foods, and just look at the just look at the facade of that building. You know, so I think it's really important to have those kind of counts. So I'm just wondering who will provide that. I do have a bit of 
research myself, but I'm just wondering who will provide that from the city? Um, I think you have, you'll have some information on the air quality on arterials. Um, so Carol and our, our team will, will get that. I don't know, is that today or tomorrow or? Tomorrow morning. Yeah, so, so you'll, you'll get some more information on that. Uh, the one thing I would also just mention in terms of prior to, um, we are anticipating fewer vehicles as the years go forward as well. And uh, if we see that the arterial is going to remain there for quite some time, uh, we would also be interested in doing uh, improvements to try and make the corridor better. Uh, so uh, just so you know, we are anticipating 10% re reduction in uh, over the next 20 years on, on prior to volumes. So um, it sounds like we're going to talk about this more tomorrow, but I just want to get that question out. Jennifer, could you ask your question about um, uh, impacts on uh, people with trains and noise and all that? Perfect. Right. It's actually just another question. I think I would just leave it. Can you get that mic? Thanks. Oh. Hey, guys. Um, so I was actually just forming another question on that. But um, basically, my concern was uh, the trains and um, the, the neighborhoods surrounding the, the train tracks. Um, I personally, I don't live over there. I'm, I'm over at the McLean complex, but I also hear the trains every night. Um, now, my main concern is the families that are living over at the Stamps complex. Um, they're being woken up multiple times a night uh, to the train noises, the uh, pollution in the air that's creating health problems within the people over at Stamps. Um, the sleep disturbances, which are creating mental health issues as well. Um, now, it's a huge concern for me because being the president at Raycan, I also see a lot of the, um, the detrimental effects in my neighborhood for, for our families and for the kids. Uh, when the kids are going to school and they're tired, it's not really absorbing the lessons that they need to learn that day. Um, now, is there a possibility of an underground tunnel that may be able to improve the air quality, the sleep quality, and um, the air quality, sleep quality, and uh, basic living quality for the people that are living at Stamps and surrounding community? Thank you for bringing those issues up. And I know that our um, engineering staff that are presenting tomorrow about the transportation performance are going to address that. So I just wanted to make sure we didn't lose it. Um, the question though, that I want to face for you is uh, table six, Jennifer, your question about uh, the additional route. Uh, you Maria? Oh, Maria, thank you. Oh, uh, hi. I don't know if this is going to get addressed tomorrow as well, but um, I know the Strathcote Residents Association had proposed a route along National that would connect to Charles at the last a residents association where the residents were told prior street was back on the table, which everyone's shocked. Um, that route was not being considered yet, and I'm wondering if it will be considered now. Uh, it will be, yeah, you'll see more information on that. Is it today? This afternoon. This afternoon. Yeah, so you'll, you'll see that, uh, you'll see that exact proposal uh, on, on the screen <laughs> with the analysis. Yeah, and kudos to the community for proposing it and yeah. to the city staff for taking it and doing as much preparation as they could to make sure that it is one of the options you guys will be uh, looking at. So we're almost at the end of our time here, and um, I, maybe I'll just run through the questions that you've submitted, just to, the, the themes of them, and you can grab a couple uh, to respond to. So there were some about the viaduct, and I just want to say, if you want to know more about the viaduct, in the back corner there, there's a resource table, and um, <laughs> thank you. And um, there is some information there about the viaduct. The viaduct team has updated the materials to be the latest uh, information. So that we have that there, plus a bunch of the other plans and materials that you are um, that we sent you links to. Um, do we have to limit our choice to one route? Um, why are we not looking at areas um, in like uh, more north of here um, because those areas need more improvements as well? Um, uh, can you talk a bit about um, uh, act, active transportation and accessibility? Uh, those are those are all good. Um, one is uh, uh, in terms of looking for options further north. We're actually specifically interested in an arterial that exists between Hastings and Terminal. 
so north of Hastings wouldn't be useful in serving the flats. So this is an arterial that would serve the, the new hospital and also provide you know the access for trucks to Provost Row and all of this stuff like that. So so it's kind of specific that it has to be between terminal and uh, and Hastings. In terms of multiple routes, I think that's a really interesting question and. I, I hope you'll, you'll take some time to think about that uh, because uh, you could you could do um, you know two smaller crossings instead of one big one I guess um, and the walking and cycling piece as well um, you might want more crossings for walking and cycling because it's such a, a, a like it's hard to walk around at long distances so um, that's something that I think is also worth talking a lot about. Is walking and cycling connections separate from car, and how much can they be integrated? Thanks. I think we got through almost all of your questions, not all by any means, and we will, any ones that are remaining, follow up on. Um, the last one is I want to end with is from Lori at Table 7. Um, the question about making decisions. Hi, I'm Lori. Um, so I was curious, is it a possibility that the panel cannot come to a recommendation? And if that is the case, does it basically, engineering is the next box on the flow chart, do they basically do whatever they want? <laughs> no. <laughs> so the way it would work is that uh, if you've kind of tried to come to a conclusion and you don't come to one, uh, I think that you'll still come up with a lot of really great advice, <laughs> uh, which you would pass on to us. And that might be a pretty extensive list. And we would take that of course, and take it to the next round of consultation to try to make a decision. Uh, ultimately, when we bring forward a recommendation to council, it's one that we want to have a lot of people supporting. In fact, we, with all of our projects, we want to have, you know, Strathcona residents and Protos Row and the BC Trucking, uh, everyone lining up to speak to council as to why they should adopt this recommendation. <laughs> That's when, we've known, when we know we've done a really good job. And so, just so you know, when, when, whatever uh, this panel process comes up with, uh, the next step is for us to kind of do that work. Uh, because we'll ultimately, if we're going to uh, entrench it into a plan that becomes a permanent policy document to guide our work going forward, or if it ultimately results in an actual investment uh, or a proposal, uh, we, have a, we have a lot of work to do there. Thank you so much, Lon. I'm at the back of the room. Because, uh, um, and uh, thank you all for your questions. This is Sabrina. She does media for the city of Vancouver. And she's also going to take a group photograph of us. And uh, I was going to, we were going to do it over there, but I see that the sun is out. And so I'm wondering, 